2018 is almost over. And we did a lot of reading this year and not a lot of vlogging. 2018 was kind of like a train wreck in slow motion. <laughs> Yeah. For highs. both of us, the highs were really high, the lows were extremely low, we got flashed on the subway, my best friend got married, like... I lost my job, I found other jobs. It's been a crazy year. Both our computers broke down for large <laughs> chunks of time. But we did find some truly great gems this year. We did. We are here to talk about them. Yes. So enough of us complaining about our problems. <laughs> <laughs> and here are the things that lit up our life. So these are our top 10 reads of 2018. These books haven't necessarily come out in 2018. Some of them are from before, but we read them this year, so we think they're worth mentioning. These are in no particular order. Also probably worth throwing out there. Okay, they're in an <laughs> order. All the books we both read and then the books that one of us has read. Yes. <laughs> but that does not have to do with their writing. We are so bad at this. We haven't done this in so long. <laughs> First on the list is Muse of Nightmares by Lainey Taylor. We both loved this book. She made me read the first one and I was kicking and screaming. I, I went so hard as buying it for her for her <laughs> birthday. <laughs> and I mean, I, it worked. I read it and it was great. She was right. And then we both read Muse of Nightmares and we had to fight for that book. We did. We did. I actually did a whole review on it. So if you want to find out exactly what happened and what we think, go there. Suffice it to say, if you're not a big Lainey Taylor fan, still check out this book because there's some great like characters and themes and plot and it just kind of blows your mind. I love Laszlo Strange. He's the best. We've been following Pater O'Gillan's series. Well, it's not a series, it's a duology. It started with The Call and it ended with The Invasion. And this is a dark fairy story. Very dark. Real dark. Real dark. People die. There are limbs, there are people turned into other people. It's real dark. This is one of the few times that I like the sequel more than I like the first book. And I loved The Call. The Invasion took what was set up in The Call and just managed to build on it in like the best possible way. And the writing style kind of feels like someone's telling you this story and they've told you this story a million times. So it's kind of worn in, which has this really cool feel to it. And the end is like, spectacular, you know, there are consequences, there's a twist, it's just really heartfelt and sweet. Just read it. It's so good. <laughs> One of the most atmospheric and genre-specific books that we read this year was The Dark Descent of Elizabeth Frankenstein, which was published for the 200th anniversary of Frankenstein. And this book did something really cool. It took a character that was kind of very minor in the original book, Elizabeth Frankenstein, and turned her into the main character, and she's an unreliable narrator throughout this book. Kirsten White does not hide her twists. Like, you can kind of see the big twists coming, and once that twist happens, then it kind of leaves you in this state of not knowing what's gonna happen next, and that's when she gets really dark. <laughs> she manages to create a monster, like a really, like, vivid scary monster in this book. She manages to make you love Elizabeth Frankenstein and kind of sink into her worldview even though you know that she's not quite thinking straight. And then by the end of it you're kind of like you're really rooting for her. Mm -hmm. And this is a book where I would really love a sequel but at the same time I'm okay if there isn't one. So she manages to take the themes and the ideas kind of set out in Frankenstein and really like twist them into the story and build on them and create something new and really interesting to read. So if you haven't read it you totally should check it out and this book has inspired me to go and pick up her like Vlad the Impaler retelling because... <laughs> why not? Why not? <laughs> Damsel was probably the darkest book I have read all year and I have read some dark books this year. This is a spin on the classic fairy tale about the prince rescuing the damsel from a dragon. Now this book is short but it packs a punch like a nuclear bomb. I'm really torn with this because on one hand I would say you should look into it because some of the things that this book deals with can be really upsetting but at the same time going into it blind almost makes it more effective but you kind of really need to know what your comfort level is. I read this book over the course of one afternoon <laughs> <laughs> a giant mistake. 
<laughs> I'm lucky that daylight savings time hadn't happened yet and that when I left work it was still light out and the sun, it was warm. Seven years ago I read The Road by Cormac McCarthy <laughs> and I, I still viscerally remember walking outside and the birds were chirping and I could feel the grass between my feet. Damsel was the second time I did that <laughs> where I was just, I needed the world back, you know? <laughs> I needed the sun on my face and the biggest Starbucks drink I could get my hands on <laughs> because this book is dark and what it does is amazing and I think it needs to be read, but... Maybe pace yourself Maybe pace yourself. Don't do what I did. Um, <laughs> I, on the other hand, was like, ooh, this is real dark. I'm gonna read this in 100 page chunks and it's a lot better that way, oh, I God. think, because you can give yourself some breathing room. Now, don't get us wrong. It is, like, beautifully written. Written. I think I was reading the book and I had an ebook and I was just like highlighting passage after passage after passage. It's beautiful. But at the same time, the subject matter just makes you so uncomfortable. It's like every like toxic, toxic masculinity thing just kind of like shoved under this veneer of a, a fairy tale story. But in a, not in a way that it's shoving it down your throat, but in a way that you're just like it's absorbing it. It's forcing you to face what's kind of been baked into your worldview. How insidious some misogynistic ideals are and just kind of forces you to face them head on and like, man. But it's a fantastic huh. book and it's totally worth reading. So please check it out. It's just not quite for the faint of heart. And it's not super graphic most of the way through, but like there is gonna be a couple of scenes that are Kind of deal yeah, with. it's hard to take. Let's go to the other end of the spectrum for dark fun stuff to After the End of the World by Jonathan L. Howard, which, okay, fun story about this book. When Jonathan L. Howard was writing this book, he was trying to find a way to differentiate his timeline in this book from reality because there was a big event that caused the two timelines to split. And he thought, I know, Nazis. <laughs> Pretty unrealistic, right? <laughs> So that led to one of my favorite Twitter threads that I read this year where Jonathan L. Howard was talking about writing after the end of the world and now realizing that there's a rise in fascist, like, Nazi thought and being like, oh. So reading this now, it's interesting because it comes from before this, this was an before actual this reality. Was an actual reality and so that was kind of fun. <laughs> but on the other hand, it's like very Cthulhu, like yeah. cosmic horror, um, characters you know, you love and have gotten to know and just them kind of dealing with the craziness of finding themselves in another reality, confronting Nazis and trying to defeat a secret Nazi organization while they're stuck on an island. And Jonathan L. Howard is like, does wonderful things with genre and so he's playing with the kind of like sci-fi mad scientist like secret conspiracy oh, the only way he's capable of <laughs> which is amazing and i think my favorite part was how the super evil like nazi secret organization has to keep redoing this ritual to <laughs> keep the eldritch abominations somewhat at bay which involves like multiple sa like human sacrifices and it's so banal because they've been doing this like every day for how many decades now they're just like oh god it's just oh, we need to find another way to do this slit and neck thrown in and you're just like <laughs> and then the main character Carter is watching this and he's just like totally horrified so you have the two different viewpoints playing out in front of you and it's it's fun. Read that one. It's fun. It's great. Read the first one. It's fun. It's fun. Neil Gaiman decided that he wanted to do a Sherlock Holmes adaptation and in typical Neil Gaiman fashion he did it spectacularly. A Study in Emerald is a retelling of a study in Scarlet but with Cthulhu shoved in there for good measure and so we read the comic book adaptation of Neil Gaiman's short story and it's amazing. Because <laughs> you're reading this book and you know, things feel very similar to like a Sherlock Holmes, but then the details and the differences to like a regular Sherlock Holmes book slowly start to seep in through like the imagery and through the characters that he's interacting with. We're like, oh, things are just like, just a little bit wrong. And then the cosmic horror element hits you and you're just like, 
I want more. Like, <laughs> it's so upsetting that there is just one short story and one comic book adaptation. Like, this would make an amazing TV show or amazing series of books that I would just devour. Yeah, it would be phenomenal. So please, Neil Gaiman, if you're out there and listening to this, which you might be, who knows, please do more of this. You know, thinking about it, like, 2018 has been very much full of cosmic horror for us, and I wonder if that says something. <laughs> <laughs> the old ones are coming back. <laughs> we had an interesting time this year because we were just minding our business and we ended up getting in touch with HarperCollins and they were running an event and we're like, okay, that sounds good. What book are they featuring? And it turns out they were featuring The Black Witch and The Iron Flower and Laurie Forrest was coming in to talk slash sign books. Real cool, but this one had heard about a controversy and she was yeah. telling me about it and I was like, oh, well, I guess I should read this book before I go see this author. And then I started reading this book and then I just kept reading <laughs> this book. It was amazing. It's like an older Harry Potter almost. They're in university, but this author just like delves right into her character. She's very much drawing from the real world, you know, racism and fascism and all this kind of stuff and throwing it in this book and these characters have to like learn to get along and then figure out a way to fight the force that is coming at them just through politics and societal nonsense. It's all about um, overcoming uh, like learned prejudice and exactly how difficult that can be because it's not something that you can just throw away because throw away it's so built into like who you are and just the different levels of different types of prejudice that people you encounter could have. Or like the little things that you do that you wouldn't think about as being racist until you kind of switch your perspective and you're like, ooh, that is a little, no, don't do that. It's done in a palatable way where you're just like, you're very into this character and her worldview as it changes is phenomenal to watch. Like there's a steady progression. Like, cause you can't just drop everything. It's mm -hmm. a very steady progression. And then, so, by the time I finished The Black Witch, I was like ready for the Iron Flower and I just devoured that too. And they're both, they're, they're on an equal level, which I think is very hard to do. So kudos to Lori Forrest. And if you've heard some bad things about this book, I at least encourage you to check it out. I wrote a post about my view on the story. Yeah, don't judge this book specifically by the rumors. I loved it. So once upon a time, Catherine Valenti got into a Twitter discussion. It kind of came out like, imagine if you could do a space opera about Eurovision. Catherine Valenti is just like, okay. And so space opera exists. Space opera to me kind of felt like if you took a Douglas Adams book and then just gave it a smoothie of like hallucinogenic psychedelics, <laughs> because this book is wild. Like this book made me feel like I was on drugs. There are sentences that are as long as paragraphs and it works. It's like ridiculous. The premise of this book is that there is like an intergalactic Eurovision and this was created to stop different planets from getting into wars. And so humanity is now at the point of maturity that they can enter this intergalactic empire. But to prove that we're not all psychopathic monsters <laughs> that want to kill the rest of the universe, they have to sing for acceptance. So if we were to lose Eurovision, like come into last place, then they will just annihilate us, reset the planet, and whatever species takes over will like have a chance. So like this might be the coming of the grasshoppers. So the main character is this guy named Decibel Jones. He is like every pop rock diva just rolled into one and he is just this wonderful character who just says the best stuff and you feel for him and you feel for his band and you really want them to be able to compete in this competition and like place well because you know humanity is relying on them and <laughs> humanity doesn't really like think they have a chance because Decibel Jones is washed up. So it is so much fun. It's really really like hilarious and I definitely want to reread it because I don't think I got everything out of it the first time. So if you haven't read this book, please do. It's amazing. Check out the rest of her stuff as well. Oh, and it's being made into a musical. So I don't normally read middle grade. It's not usually my thing. There's a couple of exceptions that I've made, one of them being the Cassie Clare Holly Black series. But this one happened to catch my eye at Book Expo and I just was like, all right, I'll give it a go. And it's Arusha and the End of Time. And it is the most adorable, 
wonderful, like gorgeous, cute little series about a girl named Arusha who has a tendency to stretch the truth a little bit. And she lives in a museum and she accidentally touches a lamp that brings on the destroyer who was meant to wake the god of death oh, I think, and just causes a whole bunch of shit. That means that Arusha has to find her fellow Pandava brothers, but they're actually sisters at this point, and stop the destroyer from waking up the old god and the end of the world. So she and her new friend slash sister Minnie end up going on a trip through basically Indian mythology and meeting a whole bunch of different characters on the way. Characters that I personally don't recognize because I don't know a lot about Indian mythology but that was kind of half the fun is like they're like oh that's that's this person and this person is not what I expected because <laughs> in the book in the mythology he's like this but oh that's that's cool and I'm like oh that is cool <laughs> and so she does imagery really well like the night market is beautiful and it's also a Costco <laughs> it's kind of got like an Alice in Wonderland vibe almost I love it and the characters are just really fun and well done and it's an absolutely adorable, enjoyable series that I'm dying to get more of because it is just, it seems like it's gonna be a ride all the way through. Even if you're not into middle grade, I highly suggest you come and pick up this book because it is really cute. Last book on our list of books of 2018 is V.E. Schwab's Vengeful. And I have been waiting for this book for years. So Vengeful is the follow-up to her previous villains book, Vicious, and it's the return of my boy Victor Vale and Eli Ever, who have the best comic book names, period. And so Vengeful introduces new characters, Marcella, who is just this amazing badass woman. She's sick of being taken for granted and scored, and if that means she's gonna take over the entire city and like turn everyone into ash, including her husband, well, she's gonna do it. So if you like morally ambiguous characters and like fun driven characters and a good tale of revenge, then totally check out Vengeful and Vicious by V.E. Schwab. You will not be disappointed. Thank you so much for watching our list of the top books that we read in 2018. It has been crazy. We know there is going to be more amazing books next year. And um, tell us what you thought of these books or what books were your top picks for this year. Let us know in the comments. And we will see you guys next time. Bye. Bye.